Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to talk about the concept of the so-called rude interview or the awkward interview. And obviously the offset video interview, whatever you want to call it with Bobby Altoff, like let's not lie, that definitely inspired this video. So in today's video, I want to talk about her, her podcast, her interview style, and then also give you some examples of two other people who are also known for this sort of rude, awkward interview style and sort of talk about where it comes from, reasons why it works for some people, reasons why it doesn't work for others, and just laugh at some of the interview clips if we're going to be honest. So let's just go ahead and get into the video. Originally, Bobby came to internet fame as a momfluencer. She was mostly popular on TikTok, where I believe her original account had about 3 million followers. Now Bobby's the host of the Really Good Podcast. I thought she only interviewed rappers, but she has other artists and personalities on there too. And so far she's interviewed people including Rick Glassman, Jason Derulo, Mark Cuban, Jay Balvin, Shaq, and Charlie Puth. The Really Good Podcast first episode that's currently available, which is the one with Rick Glassman, was uploaded on June 1st. Do you own a house? I don't. I rent. Oh my god. It's really embarrassing, right? And that's the stuff, like I get you're being playful, but like that's the judgmental stuff that bleeds through you mm -hmm. to assume that I'm embarrassed because of what? Because I'm I'm renting because I can't afford to own a home? Yeah. Yeah, and that's fine. I don't feel bad about that, but that's why this is going the way it is. Okay. That was I just think that's embarrassing. However, there were prior episodes like one with Colleen Ballinger and another one with Michael Bublé, and Bobby has said to have deleted these because they didn't quote pop off. The really good podcast episodes are titled after a quote that Bobby's guests give, typically as a response to her demeanor. Some include Lil Yachty's, I'm carrying your conversation on your podcast, and Jay Balvin's, you have that super resting B face. Since their release, several clips of the really good podcast have gone viral on TikTok and Twitter. I know people especially like Bobby's episode with Funny Marco, who is a popular online comedian. Funny Marco has a similar dry, fake, confused disposition to Bobby. It's more inviting, albeit, and some have even said that she's modeled her interview style after Funny Marco's personality. I would hope me and you can do something together one day. A movie? Yeah. I do too. Yeah, I really think it could be dope. It should be called Tinder Going Wrong, where we meet on Tinder, and then we find out you're not my type, I'm not your type. But we're I already just, on it. I don't believe that I'm not your type. Aside from her high-profile guests, Bobby's mostly known for her deadpan, critical, and disinterested style of interviewing, Insider said. The humor of her videos is less about punchlines and more about seeing the baffled and unexpected reactions from the celebrities she interviews. And they're right. If you laugh, at least for me, it's sort of that like what the fuck laugh of discomfort. When it comes to the really good podcast, one of the biggest questions people are asking is how she's able to pull such big names when her podcast's not even a year old. Yes, she had a social media presence prior, but few people, even with those large platforms, are pulling A-list guests in their first handful of episodes unless they're known in that circle already. For this reason, people assume that Bobby's a plant or a Nepo baby of some sort. And people even assume that her father or somebody close to her was high up in the music industry, hence her getting these interviews with rappers so quickly. A tweet from a confused viewer reads, Does her father own Drake's masters? I'm trying to figure out how this industry plant is interviewing Drake when respected black journalists can't even get a nod from him. In her episode with Drake, Bobby said her father builds houses for a living. She also says that he did something, not sure if that means a house though, for Snoop Dogg. If he's some sort of architect or developer or something like that for a lot of stars or people in the industry even, that could explain the connections. And in her appearance on the Barstool BFS podcast, Bobby was asked how she got the Drake interview. And then Drake, you saw so then he, Drake's, like, my video with Marco went very yes, viral, yeah. like very viral. I didn't That's expect it. That's when I first started. That's okay. when I became aware of you. Yeah. Then Drake liked one of the videos I had uploaded and he followed me and I was like, okay, I'm going to like shoot my shot to Drake. I don't know how this, I, I thought the chance of him replying was like a 1% and then the chance of him saying yes was like 0. 0.000. Yep. I was like, there's no way. Bobby sent signs to one of the leading talent agencies, WME, and has said that she only pretends to be an industry plant. The Drake episode of the Really Good Podcast actually isn't on Bobby's channel anymore and has been re-uploaded on a different channel. Some have speculated that this was due to a calculated move that Drake made. About halfway through the interview, Bobby pretends to have never heard a Drake song and then basically does the same thing about Tyga, so Drake plays a little bit of Rack City. If someone was like, oh, have you ever heard Kiki, Do You Love Me by like Tyga? Yeah. You would be like, you would fully be convinced. Absolutely. Her. There's no, okay. There's absolutely. What's your favorite Tyga song? Is he married to Kylie Jenner? 
Well, the guy that dated him? He dated I mean, the like, her? I, like, yeah, maybe, like, before, like, the iPhone or something. <laughs> like, that's such ancient Does gossip. Does he sing? Huh? He raps? He sings? Yeah, what's his, what's your favorite Tiger I don't, song? I don't know who that is. The theory was that Drake played this song so he could sort of control Bobby's video with the threat of copyright, and then something behind the scenes went down that led him to claim the video and get it removed. But again, this is just a theory and I'm not sure if it's true because in that case, I feel like it would make more sense for him to just use one of his own songs and he had the perfect excuse to do that because Bobby was acting like she'd never heard any of Drake's music either. Others are speculating something else happened, like the two had a personal falling out behind the scenes. And I'm not clear at this point why the full Drake interview isn't on Bobby's channel anymore, but some of the shorts from the interview are still available. Every really good podcast interview I've watched, it seems like the person Bobby's interviewing gets frustrated at some point and you can see when the switch flips. No, I just have the... Super be resting face. Probably, if that's what you think, Jay, Jose, Jose. Balvin. Jose. Okay, don't correct me. But of course I have to correct I'm you because I want you to be better. People that are looking at these podcasts right now, they'll be like, she's not saying the name the right way. She don't like Latinos. And you're in a Latino place. I do think, though, that through these interviews, I found out a lot of the guests that I wasn't as familiar with are funnier than I assumed that they were. Most of their funny comments came out when they were defending themselves and just going in on Bobby. And personally, I do think that Lil Yachty and Offset took it in that department, especially Offset. I pay for a lot of things and I get things given to me. What about your earrings? Yeah. Those look expensive. Yeah. Are they real diamonds or are they fake? Carrots. How many? Seven. Seven. Yeah. On what each, about your on chain? Hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, you're drilling me. Let's see. What's your chain? This is my interview. It's not yours. I mean, it's ours. No, I'm interviewing you. And I'm allowing you to interview me. It's a partnership. But I do think Yachty is right. Even though he said it out of frustration, I do think he's right in saying that Bobby's guests kind of carry the interviews. And I don't think this has everything to do with Bobby's deadpan shtick because there are several comedians that this actually does work for. For me, one, the comebacks are a little bit lacking because coming at people really only works and makes for good entertainment if both of the people in the conversation are really quick on their feet with the comebacks. Also, it feels like few meaningful or even interesting questions are being asked even at the beginning of the interview when you're really meant to grab people. And personally, I do prefer the types of interviews where artists are talking mostly about their work because I love to hear their take on things that happen behind the scenes, you know, the creative process or any extra little tidbits that I wouldn't get just from listening to the music or just watching the project. And usually within those interviews, more personal things do come up where you get to see their personalities more, but the interview is still focused. Similarly, the whole not knowing who the artist is gimmick doesn't lend itself well to an interview. And it's not even, oh, I'm going to pretend not to know you so I can act as the stand-in for the audience and you can tell me more. It's, I'm going to pretend I don't know you and also that I don't care anything about who you are or what you do. And if you're conducting an interview, your job is to extract information from the guests so that the audience has a reason to watch because there's information to be gained. And I guess because it is part of her shtick, Bobby really can't ask any deep questions without giving up the bit because that would give away that she does know who her guests are. But part of me has to wonder at what point does sticking to the bit supersede getting an interesting interview? What do you do for a living? Huh. Let me put it all in, sum it up for you. I'm an artist, you know? An artist? Yeah, fashion. I'm you an said actor. that word a little bit weird. I said, what word? Artist. How, what was weird about it? How you said it, it was weird. I you mean, there's a lot of things you say sound weird, but okay. I don't point it out. You actually do. And this is an example of because she's not asking any real questions, she loses control of these interviews kind of quickly. Like, for example, Offset is someone who is very into fashion, posts about fashion, talks about fashion, is a judge on a fashion-based competition show. And instead of asking him any questions about his fashion philosophy or his favorite designers, she just spends a lot of time picking apart what he's wearing. And then if Offset does bring up a designer, she just acts like she doesn't know who they are or just criticizes them. So having someone on the show who has such an interest that so many questions can be based around is just kind of lost in this interview. And to be entirely fair, there could have been a decent follow-up question after the so you're into fashion question, but we don't get there because she criticized the way Offset said the word artist. So now he's on the defense and is like, so what do you do? And then this is where we get the whole exchange of you reached out to me and who reached out to who. So we got away from the actual topic at hand pretty quickly. Peace. Okay. Um... Next time, mm -hmm. 
Come on time. I have something to talk about. Oh, okay. I, I, You're not I talking was about shit. Just Folks, letting not you know. Fair. Just putting that in there. I was asking you about your a lot of things. Your career. The obvious. The obvious and what your is, shoes. Just the thing. So, like, how long have you been at your career? Like, interviewing? Um, Like, a couple months. And also within that realm that I touched on earlier of Bobby not knowing what a slang term is, this comes up in almost every interview she does with a rapper. And so next I want to touch on the Lil Yachty episode because this comes up multiple times. So in that episode, she asks him what Lil means and how it's pronounced and all of that. And so instead of hearing a guest explain something we don't know, which would be more interesting, we're watching them explain, often with resistance, something that everyone already knows. And I think because I see a lot of comments about this specifically in the TikToks that I've been looking at of Bobby's where she's like, what does this slang term mean? I think a lot of people's issue with it is that the question is asked from a place of condescension, it feels like, rather than genuine interest because it's not a genuine question. I said, I know that white people have a stronger background with boats than black people. <clears throat> okay. Meaning for anything, if I know anything, I know you know how to say it better than I would know how to say it. Little? Nope. I know how to say yachty. That's not the problem. There it is. I'm asking about the first word. Lil. Why didn't you go for big? Oh, like, like a black slang thing. Yeah, I just don't understand how to say it. And to pull another example, earlier in that same episode, Bonnie asked Lil Yachty what a hookah is at the very beginning. I know what a hookah is. I'm sure she does. I'm sure y'all do. So you get nothing from this exchange except for Yachty playing them back because what, what else is he supposed to do? But then I'm also wondering if it's just for pure entertainment and it's not supposed to be that deep or that serious. What is the point of having these artists on? Because as the episodes go on, I find myself watching more to see how the guest is going to respond to Bobby rather than being interested in them as a guest. And later on, after the interview on the Barstool BFF podcast, Bobby accused Yachty of being awkward to her and not greeting her when she arrived at his house, which is why the interview came off so badly and just sort of awkward. Even acknowledging that I'm like in the room and my oh, camera guy's like my setting up. I'm just sitting there like Skin on crawling. my phone, like tr I'm like trying. And then he comes up, he's like, oh, hi. Gives me like a half hug and I'm just like, hi. Then goes back to his spot and I'm like, dude, I don't even want to do this. I'm texting my friend like, Ashley, I need to leave. This is so awkward. I don't want it. Like, what am I doing? And I just don't get how this is fair to say because she treats people the exact same way in the interviews for millions of people to see. And if his demeanor was similar to how it was on camera, I don't think he's being any worse to her than she is to him. And fine, maybe Bobby's doing a character, but I don't really think, oh, this is my gimmick, this is my character. I really don't think that frees you from someone having a reaction to your behavior. I've seen several articles questioning whether the criticisms on Bobby's interviews means that this is the death of the so-called rude interview. In an Evening Standard article on the topic, they use Emilia de Moldenberg's chicken shop date as an example, saying that Bobby's interviews may have killed that sort of format. Chicken Shop Day is a YouTube series that started in 2014 in which Amelia invites entertainers, musicians, and athletes alike to have an awkward chicken shop date that doubles as an interview. The author, Maddie Mewson, points out that where Amelia can be charmingly awkward, Bobby can be off-puttingly so. They cite the exchange from her interview with Offset in which Bobby says she didn't want to get to know Offset and that his team wanted her on her show and reached out. Mewson writes, It's the untrained, unprepared, and ungrateful aspect that gets me, performative or not. There's no shortage of black female podcast hosts or podcasts dedicated to rap and hip hop or music journalists, many of whom I'm sure would be thrilled to interview a rapper of offset scale and who would create meaningful content. A similar point was made in one of DJ Academics videos where he talked about the Drake and Lil Yachty interviews. He or his co-host, I'm not sure, called Drake out for watching the funny Marco interview with Bobby and then choosing to do a video with Bobby rather than doing something with Marco. The Evening Standard also includes a Jamel Hill tweet that you might have seen floating around in regards to the Bobby interviews. Jamel tweeted, I don't find these types of interviews particularly enjoyable or interesting. Instead, it just sadly points out how real hip-hop journalism has been practically erased. Some of the media teams behind these artists aren't interested in them sitting down with credible people who know how to tell stories and do quality interviews. Then they wonder why an artist's real story goes untold, neglected, or that artist is misunderstood. Mewson also points out how Bobby goes out of her way to look uncomfortable in black spaces for comedy, a criticism I've likewise seen from several online this week. Though Mewson isn't a fan of this style of interview and hopes the Bobby backlash, so to speak, ends it, she does say of the two, Chicken Shop Date does it better. She even notes that as the series has gotten more popular, Amelia has been granted interviewing opportunities outside of it. She's interviewed stars at red carpet events like the Golden Globes and Vanity Fair's Oscars After Party. In addition, Amelia has also contributed to pieces from publications like The Guardian, Vogue, and Vice. 
Personally, I don't find the chicken shop date interviews to be rude and don't get as weird or annoyed as a feeling when watching them. It feels like Amelia wants to be there and even her quips don't come off as rude. She's an example of someone that I would call more deadpan but not rude. One big distinction I noticed is that she doesn't go out of her way to diminish or belittle her guests or the whole interview is not just focused on to what extent she can try to embarrass them or make them uncomfortable. I went through and watched some of Amelia's older interviews too just to make sure I wasn't only going off of the recent ones that I'm familiar with. So for example, I did watch one with Maya Jamma and it's about six years old. And for the first few moments, I was like, okay, mm, she's being a little snarky. Like I can still get that it's an act, but I can also see how someone else might be uncomfortable by this. Are you and Jamma related? <laughs> no, but we do have a little debate about who's the real Jamma. So him. Me. Him then. Me. But then as soon as I thought that, Maya says like a lyric or a quote and Amelia mouths the rest of it and finishes it with her. It's such a small thing, but it is a subtle way of showing you're engaged in the interview and aren't attacking your guest. I've got like this little phrase. It's a kind, of, kind of like a bit extreme for your dating situation, but it's like, if you love someone, you should tell them because hearts are often left broken with words left unspoken. Yeah. And it's like the same if you like someone because you could go your whole time not telling them and playing games and then they get a girlfriend. Watching newer interviews, it's clear that Amelia's gotten better at blending that awkwardness with the actual interview and using it as a better jumping off point. It's also clear Amelia is familiar with the people she's interviewing or at least did a little bit of research beforehand. Like while she's asking a sort of silly question, she'll reference a project that person did so they can offer up more about that experience if they want. I feel like you'd be good on a reality show though. My dream would be like to be a producer, like the one that's like stirring the shit. Yeah. So just making everyone's life hell. Yes. You were good on that Hunger Games one. Thank you. It was bleak. Mm -hmm. it really unfair as well. Highly unfair. Like just also about, children. It's actually mental. I it's... asked my husband way late into our relationship. We were like, like on your we wedding a, day. On our wedding day, I was yeah. like, do you like the Hunger Games? Mm -hmm. And then he just died laughing at me and like texted all my friends that I said that. What was the answer? No, he did like the Hunger Games. Oh, thank God, because otherwise that marriage would have been annulled. I don't know. Well, right then and there. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And to be clear, I'm not saying that Amelia is the peak of journalistic excellence because she knows that Jennifer Lawrence was in The Hunger Games. I understand that almost all of us know that. But my point is, when she acknowledges that instead of going, hmm, I've never seen The Hunger Games, I've never heard of it, it elicits a better response from Jennifer and then she offers up a piece of information that we probably didn't know beforehand. Last summer, Amelia did find herself in a wave of criticism for Chicken Shop Date as her series was accused of monetizing black culture. According to a Refinery29 article written by Shazne Martin, chicken shops are more common in the ends of London, where a lot of working class black Londoners live, whereas Amelia grew up in central London. Martin says these chicken shops are community staples rooted in working class and ethnic minority culture. She writes, Chicken Shop Date's budding global recognition has opened it up to a Pandora's box of criticism. Whilst the show has been reviewed mostly positively here in the UK, people on the other side of the pond, which means the United States typically, seem to find it strange. Recently, in a discussion with YouTuber and Chicken Shop Date alumnus KSI, American comedian Andrew Schultz expresses a shock at the premise of a show where a white girl takes black people to eat chicken. Back over here, a few years ago, ZZ Mills and Giggs had a heated back and forth over social media over comments she made about black artists choosing to interview with Moldenberg instead of grassroots black presented shows. But it would be disingenuous of me to act like her skill as an interviewer is the only criticism that she's received. Martin acknowledges this, saying that she's not calling for Amelia to be deplatformed or that everyone who watches her work dislikes it. It's just important to have these conversations and quote, critique this very unlevel playing field of an industry that we are in. Amelia herself has acknowledged her privilege, especially within the space that she's in. Back in 2018, she told Complex, I'm also aware part of the reason people like watching videos is because they play off the humor that naturally occurs when two different cultures collide. I take my job in the scene that I'm working in very seriously. As I've said before, I'm very aware of my privileged position as a white woman. However, I hope I'm using it to fully support UK artists. In 2019, she told the BBC that, quote, people who aren't white have to work harder to enter this space. One of my favorite, quote, rude interviewers or awkward interviewers is Z-Way. If you're unfamiliar, Z-Way is a comedian and writer known mostly for her satire on topics like race, politics, or social issues. As satire is, I suppose, but she still keeps it light. Whenever I do press, usually maybe 90% of the time, the reporter says, I'm terrified of you. What do I do? I know the that? feeling. Go on. Sorry. Does that happen to you all the time? No, I feel terrified talking You're with you. You're terrified of me. And why are you afraid of me? <laughs> well, um, I'm not at this moment, and I'm thinking I should be because I'll let my guard down. 
but this isn't about me, this is about you. No, what tell you me say? more about your fear of me. After working as a comedy writer, Zue began her own YouTube series called Baited in 2017. On it, Zue invited fellow comedians for an interview and attempted to race bait them. You know, the bar is higher for black women. Every day I had to fight. You have a show! And even though the series does focus a lot on race, which is a heavy and divisive topic, of course, most of the jokes are lighthearted, but intended to make a point about how people of different races can and likely do have different lived experiences. And while negative things can and do come from that at times, oftentimes there are funny jokes and realizations that can also be made based on those differences and acknowledging those differences. The racial faux pas that Zue would try to get her guests to commit are in a similar vein to her short-lived eponymous show 10 series that ran from 2021 to 2023, as it was unfortunately canceled earlier this April. To emphasize its awkwardness, the show's wiki actually has one of its genres listed as cringe comedy. Some of Zue's guests in her Showtime series have included Charlemagne the God, Stacey Abrams, Chet Hanks, Julia Fox, Katya, and Amber Riley. Zue has also been noted for its similarity to Between Two Ferns, which is a comedic talk show hosted by Zach Galifianakis. Running from 2008 to 2018, the show was considered one of the originators of this so-called awkward or rude interview. In the scripted series, Zach throws uncomfortable jabs at his hosts, who likewise have witty comebacks. Some of his famed guests included Barack Obama, Brie Larson, and Keanu Reeves. I have to know, what is it like to be the last black president? Seriously? What's it like for this to be the last time you ever talk to a president? It, it must kind of stink, though, that you can't run, you know, three times, you no, know? No, actually, I think it's a good idea. Uh, you know, if I ran a third time, it'd be sort of like doing a third hangover movie. Didn't really work out very well, did it? Even if Z-Way is surprisingly blunt at times, it's still clear that it's her interview and clear that she knows about who she's interviewing. She does ask uncomfortable questions like, for example, asking Phoebe Bridgers when she's going to feature more black artists in her music. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read that one. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> I'm not reading, these are... Ridiculous. Okay, well, I mean, I'll take that. Hey, yeah. and I'll read it. I'll read it because I'm well, not afraid. I will not retweet Sean King. Thank you. Throughout, Zue's demeanor and comedic timing make it clear she's joking with the guests. And then on the viewer's end, the editing also makes it clear to us it's meant to be comedic. In a separate episode with Nicole Byers, so much of the interview clip is actually Zue correcting Nicole or pushing back on her ideas. But you almost can't tell because Zue does it in a conversational way, and even if she's being a little critical, she's clearly not being malicious. And in general, Nicole Byer is an interviewer's dream, but they do have really good chemistry. Yeah. Well, I wanted to know what the minimum wage would be in your utopia. Oh, $20 an hour. $20 an hour? You could go up if it's utopia. Oh, okay. There is no currency. How about them apples? A bit that I really enjoyed in this is when Nicole tries to act like money doesn't matter and she's just a regular girl and then Zue points out that Nicole has four TV shows. Really? Yeah, like money's bad. It's also made up. What is money? <laughs> Can you explain what money is to me like I'm stupid? And like I said earlier, Zue's work and in this segment with Nicole Byer, the bits she does to point out how Nicole is well off, this is a true example of satire, which is a term I think is thrown around too loosely these days. Most of the comment sections on Z-Way's videos are positive, and based on my very admittedly curated social media algorithm and friend groups, she is very much like. I did, however, find an article from The New Yorker in which they criticize Z-Way's interview style and the content of her interviews. Additionally, they criticized her new Showtime series for being too similar to Baited. They wrote, On Baited, Z-Way subjects non-black people to interviews about race that quickly become inquisitions. It is a fantasy comedy of entrapment in which the black woman tosses white naivete down the hatch while playfully hoarding the lock and key. There is no right answer, say, to Z-Way's demand of a white woman guest, a famous cook, to name five black people off the top of your head. Uh, yeah, Issa Rae, um, <laughs> uh, Tessa Thompson, uh, Barry Jenkins, uh, James Baldwin, does that count? I just named him. Um, yeah, it counts, but you're definitely struggling. No, I'm not. I'm just really nervous. I'm sorry. I know this sounds insane. I just really am nervous. Um, I know no, you're so doing many a fantastic job. You're doing a fantastic job. And personally, as a host, there's no judgment coming from me. The comments, however, are a different story. Because Zue is not asking a question. And yet the guest works hard to answer in good faith to look racially hip in the face of the ludicrous because she believes, whether she will admit it or not, that her reputation is hinged on a kind of obeisance. 
Because of the nature of the questions that Z-Way asks, it's to be expected at times that things are going to get awkward, even if it is comedically awkward. Z-Way's interview style is similarly straight-faced, especially when she's asking those uncomfortable questions, which is often. I do think she exudes a bit more warmth and personality on purpose to make up for that because out of the three discussed in this video, her questions and her content are the most likely to be taken the wrong way because she's asking questions along the lines of more serious topics like race, gender, class, and politics, even if the question itself is silly. No. I don't know. I, I think I did kind of make the Patois accent more like a little more trending, I guess. I think I was like, I mean, like aside from like, Jamaican culture itself and yeah. Caribbean culture itself, which is obviously very, you know, vibrant. I was like the first person to like, kind of like get in the conversation, like of just recent times. There are several articles and YouTube videos compiling the cringiest, most awkward moments on the Z-Way show. And believe me, there are several. But even in the articles that are critical of topics Z-Way addresses, I'm hard pressed to find many that call her an unprepared interviewer or a rude one. Collider writes, the host made a name for herself by strategically entrapping her guests into admitting their biases about race, gender, and politics. Despite asking hard-hitting and blunt questions, she maintains a satirical and comedic tone throughout, all while wearing television's best outfits. Because Zue doesn't shy away from what many would consider taboo subjects, her guests are often stumped and unable to craft an intelligible answer. Those moments make for some of the most cringeworthy interviews in talk show history. For her part, Z-Way said it's never her aim to get anyone canceled on her show, and a lot of the guests on her show are canceled, whatever that means nowadays, before they even come to interview her to begin with. And Z-Way herself has said that she doesn't believe in cancel culture. Rather, she just wanted her show to spark conversation that got people to examine their perspectives and biases, but still have it be entertaining and enjoyable. All right, so those are my thoughts. Those are my feelings. As always, I'm eager to hear yours. And this was a fun one to do because I genuinely do love watching celebrity interviews. And it's not just because I like the artist or the celebrity or actor I'm watching, whoever. I usually also watch them because I like the interviewer, because the interviewer can be just as interesting. And there's no real right answer or wrong answer when it comes to an interviewing style. But when it's right, it's right. And when it's wrong, it's wrong. And sometimes the, the quality of the interview you get can depend not on the person who's being interviewed entirely, but also on the interviewer, which is why it's important to make sure you're asking those good questions, you're building up a good rapport with your guests, because the level of your skill when you're interviewing and how comfortable you can make them, that can give you a completely different interview. And then more generally, I would be interested to hear thoughts on the rude or awkward interview in general. Are you like me and you think, okay, some people do it right, some people do it wrong, you know, in your personal opinion, but it's not a concept that you hate in its entirety. Or are you on the other hand where you're like, I just prefer a more traditional interview or I don't really like the awkwardness, I don't like the satire, it's just not my thing. And also, if you are someone who, like me, enjoys watching celebrity interviews, interviews with artists, things of the like, drop any of your favorite interviewers down in the comments below because I do genuinely love watching interviews, love watching people start conversations, how they interact, how they're able to get people to open up. So yeah, drop them down below and I will check them out. And as always, we will just chat about our thoughts, our opinions, our feelings down in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitter if you want to keep up with me there. And if you'd like to become a channel member, the link is in the video description. Again, thank you so very much for watching. I love you all so, so, so very much. And we'll see you so very soon. Bye-bye.